Ready to go? Yep. Well, good morning and welcome to our class on for the catechumens and the inquirers. So our plan is to uh, go until about um, 10, 15 or 11, 15 or so. And we'll take a break, five, 10 minute break, and then we'll finish it off at about 11.45. We'll have some refreshments for the break, um, depending on when uh, Mother Nancy puts them out. Uh, if you're so inclined, feel free to make your way up there and get them early. We have some apple fritters and we have some uh, uh, cheese slices and uh, croissants so that you can put together any way that you like. And then we will have um, cider, apple cider for you to drink. And I believe we have some milk for you to drink. So um, we'll meet this morning and then we'll meet next Saturday. And the next Saturday after that, October 19th, is a, an ordination at St. Mary's Cathedral and I will and Mother Nancy and I will be there so we will not have class on October 19th. Um, generally we're going to follow a sequence of two or three Saturdays on and then a Saturday off so that we're not meeting every Saturday and that gives us a break, gives me a break Give me a chance to kind of reset, recharge, and figure out where I where I brought you and where I want to go from there. Let's see, Dan and Megan, I'm I'm kind of tethered here. Do you want to come up here and come to the desk, please? Come to the teacher's desk. Okay, let's see. One for you, and one for Megan. Hang on, hang on. Where's the other one? Again, one for you, one for Megan. You'll need something to write with, guys. You need a pen or a pencil. One for you, one for Megan. All right. So let's begin here. You can get out your lecture guide and follow, use that to follow along and, uh, and make whatever notes that you want to on that lecture guide. That's yours to keep to help you follow along with the lecture. Um, and also, uh, as, you, uh, as we proceed, um, do, don't hesitate to ask questions if something's not clear to you, or if you want to uh, comment on something. Uh, feel free to, to break in. So, um, let's look at the top of your, of your lecture guide. I've, I've, I've written down what I think might be uh, the, the central questions that a catechumen or an inquirer might have. And you tell me if, there, if I'm missing anything. Who is the Orthodox Church? Where did she come from? What does she believe? What distinguishes her from other Christian churches? Fair? Is that fair? Valerie, is that fair? Do you have any other questions? Besides these? <laughs> I mean... Um, do you have any, 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 do you have any other like primary questions that we could include here? These, these questions are kind of meant to encompass the whole, you know, the whole curiosity that one might have. Well, let's approach these questions by approaching the creed of the Orthodox Church. Creed, as you probably know, comes from the Latin credo, I believe. And so the creed is the I believe that we say at every divine liturgy. And we also say it at other services as well. We call this creed the Nicene Creed. Don't, don't put down anything on your lecture guide quite yet. But technically, the creed is called the Nicene Creed is called, technically, the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. Uh, 
And that's the name of the creed, the official, the technical name of the creed. Um, but we call it, for short, we simply call it the Nicene Creed. It's called the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed because it was put together from earlier baptismal creeds used throughout the ecumene. Ecumene, so this is, I believe, is, in a, is, in a, is a vocabulary word for you. Ecumene, ecumene of the church by the Holy Fathers or the bishops of the church at the first and second ecumenical councils. All right, let's go back up here and let's so it's so-called because it was formulated at the first and second ecumenical councils. The first ecumenical council was in Nicaea in the year 325. Nicaea is just south of Constantinople. And the reason it was held in Nicaea and not in Constantinople was because Constantinople was still under construction. Constantine, the emperor, had moved the capital of the empire, um, I believe it was Milan, uh, over to uh, the Byzantine uh, Canal or Byzantine Strait and was in the process of building a new city, which was called Constantinople, the city of Constantine. Mm -hmm. And so Constantinople was not yet ready to host an ecumenical council. So it was held in Nicaea, just shortly south, a little bit south of Constantinople. Um, so that's, it's called that because it was first put together at Nicaea, the first, the first ecumenical council. But then it was edited at the second ecumenical council. This time it was in Constantinople. And that was in the year 381. The first ecumenical council is called Nicaea I because there were, I believe, three councils that were altogether held in Nicaea. And the second ecumenical council is called Constantinople I because it was the first of several councils that were held in Constantinople. So when was it formulated? It was formulated in 325 and in 381 at these two ecumenical councils. What are its sources? As I said, its sources was drawn from baptismal creeds of the church. Um, Let's say this Church of Alexandria, the Church of Jerusalem, the Church of Antioch, uh, but all of the I mean, every church had a baptismal creed. Every church and um, these baptismal creeds were formulated off of what's called what was called by the second century the rule of faith, um, the canon of faith. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's noteworthy, uh, that remarkable, that in the early centuries of the church, as you probably know, when the church was not a legal religion and was subject to outbreaks of persecution at any time, so that to become a Christian was a bit risky, it was risky business, that um, there was no central authority, you know, no centralized authority, although Rome the Pope of Rome, the Bishop of Rome, played such a role um, simply by virtue of being the bishop of the capital of the Roman Empire and also being the city where Saints Peter and Paul were uh, martyred. And so for that reason, the Bishop of Rome enjoyed uh, a prestige amongst all the other bishops of the uh, church of the Ecumene of the church. And um, in these early centuries, uh, 
matters under dispute, uh, one could appeal to the Roman bishop for kind of final arbitration. Um, and once, in, in any matter of dispute, uh, generally speaking, uh, once the Roman bishop put, uh, uh, put his stamp of approval on, on a decision made by any council, um, it, was, it, it had the weight of, of authority. It had the weight of a, a kind of a definitive uh, decision or, or um, you know, uh, act of the church. But at this point in the, t in the church's history, there was no centralized authorities as such. So it's, it's, it's all the more remarkable that, and there, there's scads and scads and scads of these baptismal creeds. Because as I said, each church had its baptismal creed, although one of the lesser churches might borrow from one a, a, a nearby greater church for its baptismal creed. So there was cooperation between the churches, but um, worldwide, you know, as far as the church was scattered throughout the Roman Empire, um, there were scads and scads of, 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 of creeds that were given to uh, the candidate for baptism, which he, was to, he or she was to recite um, to show that he or she was ready to be baptized into the faith of the church. And what's remarkable about all of this is that as you look at all of those baptismal creeds, um, they are they are all pretty much they all have the same content uh, they're formulated a bit differently but they all have the same content um, and that, that the content would consist for sure of three articles one on the father one on the son one on the holy spirit and then the fourth or the, the, the remaining articles could vary but generally they would be about uh, i believe in one baptism I look for the resurrection of the dead, uh, the second coming, um, um, consummate at the consummation of the ages. So, uh, it's so the, the the creed that was drawn up at, by the by the father, the bishops of the first two ecumenical councils, was not something that they invented. They were drawing from all of these baptismal creeds, and. But, but underneath all of these baptismal creeds, and if you will, uh, um, the engine that was driving all of these baptismal creeds and informing them was this rule of faith. Um, something of a nebulous uh, um, thing, you might say, because uh, this rule of faith um, um, was given multiple expression. So the rule of faith was not something hard and concrete that was just sitting there that y'all referred to. It was just, it was, it was a you know a spiritual. Uh, in our day, perhaps it was a spiritual meme, you know that 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 was throughout the church, and it was this meme that that governed how a particular church would put together its particular baptismal creed. So the Holy Fathers did not invent that. So the the sources of this baptismal creed um, were of this creed of Nicaea. What, let, let's say the sources were, let's say one, let's say it was the rule of faith, the rule of faith, or the canon of faith. And we actually will want to talk a bit more about this at some point, the rule of faith. Because it's not as, how would you say, it's not as, uh, as, as, as I said, it's not something that, that's written out. It's not an object that you can go to some museum or library or to some church and pull out the rule of faith. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll want to talk about that a bit more. So that's that was the source, the, the kind of the spiritual, um, the uh, the spiritual climate, the spiritual mind of the church, the rule of faith, and then let's say the, the, these two words are synonymous, and then let's say the the, the baptismal creeds. Let's say earlier. Baptismal creeds of the church. Now I've already given, I've already mentioned the terms that are on your lecture guide that are towards the bottom of the first page. Let's go over those real quick. Uh, this term ecumene is translated in different ways actually depending on the context. 
Um, but in this particular context, it's just transliterated. It'd be ecumenical. It's taken from this word, eco, which is from ecos, which means house. And this word has something to do with the earth. So in this particular context, when we talk about the ecumene of the church, we're talking about the household of the church that is scattered throughout the earth or that occupies the whole earth. So um, a secular definition of ecumenical would be the inhabited earth. Bishops, I have the Greek translated as episkopos, that's what the word is in Greek that is translated as bishop, episkopos, epi means over, above, and you should be able to figure out what skopos is, telescope, microscope, I'm going to scope you out, it means to look, okay, so as to look over. That's what a bishop is, somebody who oversees or overlooks. Um, the bishop is the uh, successor of the apostles, and it is his, jo it is his job, his, his assignment, his, his charism, his charism, his, his grace, um, specifically to administer the affairs of the church and to to be the, he's the chief shepherd. So he is responsible to protect uh, the integrity of the church against heretical expressions or heretical practices. So he is, the, the bishop is the success, let's say this, he, as I said, he's the over, he's what he oversees um, the life of the church. He um, is the successor of the apostles he is the chief shepherd of the church. Well, not chief shepherd. He is, because obviously Christ is the chief shepherd. Um, but he, let's, let's just say sh a shepherd. They are the shepherds of the church. Let's see here. Fathers of the church. At the top of the next page, the fathers of the church are the bishops. So when we talk about the holy fathers of the church... Uh, we are generally talking about the bishops, generally, but not always. The Greek word for fathers of the church would be patristics. The, th the study of the fathers of the church would be patristics. Back when feminism was rampant. I know that it still is, and in some places it has taken over. Uh, but there was the North American Patristics Society, a society of scholars who were patristics scholars. And there was a movement among the feminists to either change it or to add matristics. Matristics. which in my mind shows a complete misunderstanding of the way the church is. Because the mother, the mothers, are those who receive the seed and nurture it and bring it into incarnation. They bring it to birth like the mother of God. The fathers are those who give the seed, obviously. So in the church, the seed is the word of God that was given from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the Holy Apostles and from the Holy Apostles to their successors, the bishops. So the fathers of the church are those who are responsible in accordance with their, you know, their, their physiological properties, you might say, 
they're, those, they're the ones who are responsible for um, making sure that the seed that is disseminated to the mothers, the faithful of the church, I'm kind of speaking in a rather crude terms, um, is, is the seed that is the word of God. Um, so it's not, I don't think it's proper to talk about the, to talk about matristics. We can talk about the mothers of the church, but that has a, that, in, in, that has a different connotation. All of us are mothers of the church, but that means that we receive the seed. Mothers do not give seed. They simply physiologically cannot give seed. That's because their job is different. Um, so the fathers of the church would be, um, you know, they're, they're, they continue, if you will, uh, the fathers of Israel. Who are the fathers of Israel? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, you know, who, who, who received, whose seed, whose seed uh, contained um, the Theotokos in it, right? So through the generations, this seed, the, through the generations of Israel, the seed um, of Abraham, the seed of faith, uh, St. Paul would argue, is being handed down from generation to generation to generation until it bears its fullest fruit in the birth of the Virgin Mary as the mother of God. So now the fathers of the church are those who are responsible they're given specific responsibility to oversee that the seed that is being disseminated is the seed and that bears, if you will, let's say it this way, it is to, to make sure that the seed that is disseminated throughout the church is the seed that conceives and, 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 and gives birth to the Virgin Mary. That's something to think about. Because the role of the Virgin Mary and the role of us as mothers, at the church as a mother, is to receive Christ himself as the seed of God. But how can we receive that seed if we are not prepared to become and to be mothers of God? <laughs> So, you know, there's lots to think about there. But for now, all you need really to understand, and I'm probably giving you more information than you need at this point, but it is something to think about, is that the fathers of the church simply is the bishop. They're the bishops. And the bishops are the shepherds. They're the successors of the apostles. So as I was saying... Um, these earlier creeds, baptismal creeds, um, in spite of the absence of any local uh, centralized authority, um, all show the essential ingredients or articles. As I was saying, belief in one God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, a belief in the incarnation of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, um, teaching in his death on the cross and his resurrection and hope in his second coming when he will judge the earth. These are the cardinal tenets of the apostolic faith. Now historically, the well-known Apostles' Creed has been regarded as one of these early primitive creeds um, that was uh, put together by the apostles themselves. And each apostle came forward under the leadership of St. Peter and they each one contributed an article, so that there are, there are theoretically 12 articles to this Apostles' Creed. But the, and and this, 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 this Apostles' Creed contains all of these cardinal um, tenets, these cardinal articles that I just mentioned. You know, belief in God, the, uh, the Holy Trinity, the incarnation uh, of the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit, so forth and so on. However, um, the Apostles' Creed as the um, creation of the Holy Apostles themselves is a fiction. Um, this fiction arose apparently in the late fourth century. And it, and it, it rose up in the West, not in the East. The East never knew of an Apostles' Creed. That's not to say that the Apostles' Creed is, is not orthodox. 
I mean, it is. It, it, it's an expression of the rule of faith. But, by, when you, but, you know, as we'll see in a moment, after we get past Nicaea and Constantinople and the creed that was formulated at, that, at those councils by, the, by all the bishops of the, of, the, of the church, of the Ecumene, you know, the inhabited earth, um, when they said that this creed that we have just put together, all the bishops, of the, you understand, these, this is not a local council, these ecumenical councils. They're the councils that represent the whole church. And they explicitly say, this creed cannot be added to and it cannot be subtracted from, um, except by the bishops gathered in council again, in ecumenical council. And so um, the construction of the Apostles' Creed in the late fourth century, it's already taking place after this creed of Nicaea and Constantinople has been formulated, ratified, and, and, pro and, pro and published. So why there would be the, uh, the creation of any other creed is, is puzzling and, and problematic. I mean, what does it say about how you regard the creed that was put together by all the bishops? Why are you making another creed? Um, and so today, I as a priest, as an Orthodox priest, I have been invited to participate in, you know, um, prayer services, let's say, that are um, of the, uh, out of that are out of the Western tradition, and uh, when I see that at the heart of this prayer service is going to be the recitation of a creed, and I see that it's not the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, but I see that it is the Apostles' Creed, I hesitate. <laughs> in fact, I have actually declined to participate in such a service because I, you know, why would I, why would I, in, uh, why would I say a, a different creed? This, this creed, this creed is enough. This, this creed is, the, the Nicene Creed is the creed of the church. Why would I say another one? So as I say, the Nicene Creed is the official creed of the church. It was put together by the bishops of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church who were convened in council from throughout the Christian ecumene, from, the out, from throughout the inhabited world of the church. And so for that reason, the council was called ecumenical. Why did the Holy Fathers put together this creed? when it is but a reformulation or consolidation of all the earlier baptismal creeds of the church, and when it is saying essentially nothing new, nothing different. Why? Let's see what it would do. Um, okay, now we're going on your lecture guide. We're going back up to the last question that is at the, uh, the bottom middle of the page. What were the specific heretical teachings this creed was targeting? Okay, did we get the answer to how the Nicene Creed is related to earlier creeds, for example, the Apostles' Creed? Um, you can say it is the official, it is the official, um, 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 how would you say, consolidation, um, expression of the Church's rule of faith. Uh, the Apostles' Creed is not. That's not to say it's not orthodox, but it is not the official, you know, creed of the church and you could use the apostles creed to illumine or to explain the nicene creed but you wouldn't replace the nicene creed with the apostles creed number one it was not put together by the, the apostles number two if it was put together by anyone it was put together by probably some lay person maybe some pious monk or if it was put together by a bishop it was only one or two bishops who were in on it not the whole not all the bishops of the church. Um, so the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed was formulated with a specific objective. At Nicaea, which is the first ecumenical council, it was to refute the heresy of Arius. Of Arius. So here is, the, um, here is the specific objective of the first Nicene council, the, the teaching of Arius a presbyter or a priest from Alexandria who was teaching 
that uh, the father, that, that, that the son of God, that, that, that the son of God uh, was the first creature created by God. The Arian heresy. The, the God, the Son, and the Word of God is the first creature created by God. You can see that Arius is wanting to protect the biblical doctrine of monotheism, you know, that God is one, and there is no other. Um, but can you also see how it, uh, it uh, destroys, there, there, it, it denies the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and in so doing, it pretty much reduces the Christian faith to just another religious philosophy. So it's, it's, it's not much different from the pagan philosophies. Um, and it's not much different from Judaism. Then in that case, Jesus just becomes some kind of a, a prophet. And Islam is basically rooted in Arianism, for example. Um, then at Constantinople, in the year 381, the creed was further edited by the Holy Fathers because in the intervening decades between Nicaea I and Constantinople I, there was quite a heated controversy over terms, specific words that were used in the creed of Nicaea. And in the course of that controversy, it also came out that after having focused on the divinity of the Son, and some denying it, some affirming it, some being rather nebulous about it, not knowing whether to say yes or no. It also came out, the, the issue also came up of the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Um, so towards the end of these decades that intervened between Nicaea and Constantinople, well, it was pretty much settled through the work of Saints Basil of Caesarea, Saint Gregory of Nyssa, um, that the Son, and, 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 and Saint Athanasius, um, that the Son of God is fully divine. He is of one essence with the Father. Once that was settled, the question came up of the Holy Spirit. And there were those who denied that the Holy Spirit was was God. They wanted to call him just a grace, a force, an energy um, that was created by God. And these were called, the, this is a, uh, let's call them, we'll call it in English, say, these were the spirit fighters, the fighters of the spirit. They were called pneumatamaki, pneumatamaki, fighters of the Holy Spirit. They, they contested the full divinity of the Holy Spirit. So these were the specific object, uh, heresies that were the target of the Nicene Creed, for short, as we call it, the Nicene Creed. So we'll be calling it now the Nicene Creed. But when we say you understand that we're talking about this creed that was put together first at Nicaea and then finalized at Constantinople. It is not insignificant to note how uh, the Holy Fathers of the Church, St. Basil of Caesarea, for example, uh, defended and proved the full divinity of the Holy Spirit. Any ideas how they did it? They appealed to the prayers of the Church. And so, for example, when we uh, at the end of the prayers that we say in the Divine Liturgy or at any service, at Vespers, Matins, Compline, whatever the service is, uh, when we say at the end of those prayers, uh, and we give an exclamation that is in the name of um, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in different ways, the Father who is without beginning, then only the Father, uh, together with the Father who is without beginning, then all holy, good, and life-creating Spirit, we're, we're addressing ourselves to the Son. Um, our Lord Jesus Christ, together with the, we glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, together with God, together with His Father, God the Father, and the all holy, good, and life creating Spirit, or we say it in, in in other ways. But you'll notice at the end of these prayers, we give this exclamation that is always in the name of the Holy Trinity, and so, and not only at the end of the prayers, but you'll also notice at the beginning of our prayers, 
we address ourselves to the Holy Trinity. For example, the divine liturgy. Um, and blessed is the kingdom. Uh, blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Blessed is the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. At the vigil, what do we say? Uh, we say, glory to the holy, consubstantial, and undivided Trinity. At the beginning of a simple Vespers, or a daily Vespers, we'll, say, we'll simply say, blessed is our God. But that's a Jewish expression that comes from the Jew in the Jewish roots of the church. But we understand that God is the Father together with his Son and his Holy Spirit. So, yes, Blake? So, so, so we know that um, these phrases, that they go back yes, before these councils. Yes, that's the point. Okay. Yes, and you find them even in the New Testament. Um, J.N.D. Kelly, um, an Oxford scholar in the middle of the 20th century, wrote two marvelous books. One of them is called The the, the creeds of the church. Um, and I, he, it's just one of my favorite historical studies, early Christian creeds. He's able to show that in the New Testament itself, the, 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 the apostles and, and the leaders uh, of the church um, are um, expressing the faith um, in the, on this uh, ground plan, you know, the, the, the basic foundation um, of the Holy Trinity. Um, and this foundation itself is, is, is rooted in the Old Testament prophets and in, 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 in the Jewish, Old Testament Jewish worship. So yes, and those, this is how St. Basil, for example, proves the Holy Spirit's full divinity by appealing to the prayers of the church. So would Arius just kind of have argued like, yeah, we say that, but we're just honoring these other two beings that aren't actually... Yeah, well, yeah, he could say we believe in one God. Yeah. But he did not mean, that, he did not mean to include the Son and the Holy Spirit with that. Um, but he could also argue that he was being faithful to the Old Testament, which teaches that one is one God. Um, so this, you know, uh, the, the issues that Arius raised were not actually invented by Arius. These issues that Arius raised were actually plaguing the church, troubling the church, even from the beginning. But certainly they come to the head in the third century. So when you talk about Arius, we're talking about the beginning of the fourth century. But even in the third century, uh, this is when m many of these issues came to a head. As, as, as the, and, one of the, and one of the methodological issues uh, of, the, of the church in the second, first, second, third centuries but especially the second and third centuries, as the church is coming out of its Jewish milieu and into a Gentile uh, world, uh, and, in so, and so thereby into the world of Greek philosophy, Greek philosophical thought, um, the, um, the issue of the uh, oneness of God, um, but also the full divinity of the Son and the Holy Spirit becomes um, a problem, it becomes a challenge to articulate that without, without, um, and, and, and the temptation of many who were eventually, who eventually fell into heresy and were declared as heretics, uh, was to treat the question of God in a philosophical way, you know? Um, and so philosophically, the mind simply cannot grasp one in three, uh, three in one, cannot, cannot. Um, Epiphanius, a bishop of what, where was he? I want to say Cyprus, but I don't remember for sure where he was. Wrote a book at the, what was it, the beginning of the fourth century, I want to say? Was that it? Uh, he called it, what is it, um, treasure, the storehouse of treasury, in which he recounts all the heresies from the uh, beginning of the church up to his time. And one of his theses is that the heretics are those who try to, try to explain God in a way the mind can grasp. So they're basically becoming philosophers, trying to conceive reality in Kantian terms according to the categories of, of the mind. Um, so um, Arius was simply bringing out into the open and kind of bringing them all, bringing all of these heretical tendencies of God to their final conclusion and, 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 and uh, and uh, he, you know, as I understand it, uh, it was this whole um, controversy over the Trinity and the relationship of the Son and the Holy Spirit to the Father 
it, it morphed into many different ways in the East and uh, you know in the in the ancient world. And one of the ways that eventually came out and blossomed was in Islam. Islam theology is basically Aryan. Um, so, um, what was I saying? That um, that the um, so that the um, well, I don't remember now what I was what I was saying. Um, so, um, was it, we're talking about how the um, they defended the divinity of the spirit by killing oh, yeah. the of the church. Right, 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 right. So that's why it's not insignificant. Thank you. It's not why it's insignificant to note that the source of the church's understanding of God is not the mind. It's prayer. <laughs> it's the experience of the whole being in prayer. And that, in fact, is where the rule of faith, this, what I call this nebulous rule of faith, comes from. It's what the church sees, if you will, in her prayer. And so out of what she sees in her prayer, she speaks as best she can. But how are you going to express this mystery of God that is beyond all things in words and concepts that are bound by worldly things. You can't. So the best you can do is, like the ancient Syriac tradition, that was, this was their practice. This was their, their way to regard, to treat words and concepts as images, pictures. Is saying that it's through prayer, would that be the same as it requires revelation? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So it has to be revealed to us by God. We can't exactly put God in a box. Yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. Yes. So going off of that point, in the church, um, for us, theology is is not words about God. You know, theologos. It's the word of God. In other words, it's God himself, the divine logos, God himself. And um, true theology is, is not what we think about God. True theology is, is what we see the world to be, what we see human nature and destiny to be from the perspective of God. But how can you get into the perspective of God if God does not receive you? And how can God receive you if you haven't received God? <laughs> you see. So the theology of the church, even the doctrine of the church, coming out of this rule of faith, which is embedded in the, in the prayer of the church, they're all, they're all so many, um, they're all rooted in prayer. They're all rooted in this, in this, um, in, in this uh, communion with God. So that we all can say with St. John, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have heard with our ears, what we have handled with our hands. This is what we're proclaiming to you. And where did we see it? Where did we hear it? Where did we handle it with our hands? In the prayer of the church, culminating and centered and rooted in the Holy Eucharist. That's where we handle it with our hands. We eat it and we drink it. Um, so you see that the you know that the mind of the church and the, you know the, um, the the dogma the dogma of the church they're all they're all so many flowers if you will coming out of this ground of prayer which itself goes all the way back to the beginning the prayer of the prophets the experience of the prophets uh, the experience and, the, and and the apostles saw and heard the same thing that the prophets saw the only difference is that what the apostles saw the word that the apostles saw and heard was in the flesh. All right. So as I said, all the dogmatic statements and definitions of the other five ecumenical councils 
Look to the Nicene Creed as the rule, the standard of the faith, which cannot be added to or subtracted from. Because, as I said, this creed was formulated by not just by a local bishop, local synod of bishops, but by the whole ecumenical church. Um, so the Nicene Creed is, if you will, the creedal canon of the church, the definitive expression of the church's rule of faith. Notice that I said the definitive expression, because again, the rule of faith, if you will, is, is spiritual, it's immaterial, it's, it's, you can express it, but you can't lay hold of it, <laughs> you know? Um, so it is an expression of this rule of faith that concisely sets forth. Now listen to this. And you tell me if this is different from how you have been shaped. The creed is the definitive expression of the rule of faith that concisely sets forth the biblical witness to the incarnation and which accomplishes in those who hold it and live by it the purpose of life, which is union with God. Do you hear that? The rule of faith sets forth the biblical witness to the incarnation. Um, let me continue, and, 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 you, and, and then we'll, perhaps at this we'll take the break, and, uh, and, um, and have, our little, have our refreshments. Um, so we will want to give a very brief history of this Nicene Creed and the specific theological issues it represents but to orient ourselves to the concept of an ecumenical council, which proclaims the faith that goes out from the church's altar. Did you hear that? That proclaims the faith that goes out from the church's altar. That, in other words, in a sense, the altar, when we say altar, we mean the Holy Eucharist, because it is on the altar that the bread and the wine that will be consecrated as the body and blood of Christ are placed. So when we say the altar, we mean the whole Eucharistic mystery of the church, the whole mystery of Christ's body and blood. Um, so which proclaims the faith that goes out from the church's altar, let's first review certain key characteristics of an ecumenical council. And after we've done that, then we'll give the promised superficial survey of Nicaea I and Constantinople, Constantinople, Constantinople I as those ecumenical councils are called, and then of the five remaining ecumenical councils. This little survey hopefully will serve as the opening of the church's royal gates, as it were, to reveal a picture or an icon, a mirror of the inner life of the church. This I also want you to, 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 to catch. In which the prophetic and apostolic witness of the Bible is rooted. Let me say that again because this is very important. This will serve as the opening of the church's royal gates to reveal a picture or an icon, a mirror of the inner life of the church, the inner life of the church in which the prophetic and apostolic witness of the Bible is rooted. Um, so I've said two things that I that that, that if you know I, I want you to that I want you to catch. I've said that the creed of Nicaea is the definitive expression of the rule of faith that concisely sets forth the biblical witness to the incarnation and which accomplishes in those who hold it and live by it the purpose of life, which is union with God. And then I've also said that our survey of the ecumenical council hopefully will serve as an opening of the church's royal gates to reveal a picture or an icon, a mirror, of the inner life of the church in which the prophetic and apostolic witness of the Bible is rooted. All of this is preparatory to our, to our consideration of the last article of the creed. Um, I suspect it is puzzling, if not scandalous, to the thoughtful ear shaped in the Protestant or so-called evangelical milieu to hear in so many, you know, to hear, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Why and what does it mean to believe in the, in the church? You know, we say, 
I believe in God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This makes sense. But what does it mean to say, I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church? What is the church that we would believe in her as we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? All right. Um, so did you? So in those two statements that I asked you to really to to, to, uh, to focus on, did did you catch? I mean, what what did anything did anything catch you? How it's I don't know, is it different from what you've been, Carson? Could you say that yeah, sure, be happy to. It, what it, what I want you to catch is is the relationship of the Bible to the life of the church, the inner life of the church. Um, the way that you have gr uh, grown up and shaped, um, which, what's rooted in the other? I mean, which is rooted in which, you know? Is it the inner life of the church that's rooted in the Bible? I think that's how I was shaped. But in, from an orthodox perspective, it's the other way. The biblical witness, the Bible, the formulation of the Bible, the writing of the Bible is rooted in the church's inner life, which is the Spirit of God. I mean, what did the word of the Lord do when he came to the prophets? Did he say, okay, Isaiah, let's check to see what's written in the book. No, he said, Isaiah, this is what you're going to write. So in other words, what Isaiah wrote down was what he saw when the Lord happened to him, when the Lord came to him. It was, his, it, was, it was his encounter, if you will, with the word of the Lord. It was his experience. It was what he saw. It was what he heard, you know, in that vision of the word of God coming to him. That's what he wrote down. <laughs> that was the reference, the, you know, the, 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 what he was accountable to when he wrote down the biblical, what he wrote down in the, in the prophet. And, be, and so what he wrote down is a witness. It's a, witness. it's a prophetic witness to what he saw and what he heard in that vision, as, as is the case with any of the prophets. So you see that when St. John writes in his first epistle, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have heard with our ears, what we have handled with our hands, you understand, he's simply, he, he's not inventing this formula. He's simply giving, if you will, the prophetic formula. This is the ancient formula of Israel the Israeli, Israelite prophets. What we have seen, what we have heard, what we have handled with our hands, the only difference is that what the apostles saw was the word of the Lord in the flesh. What the prophets saw was the word of the Lord in a vision. The same word. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a break. Uh, let's, we'll give five minutes or so. And when we come back, we'll either continue, or if you have questions, we can do questions. Yeah, if you'd pause it. We can go on with questions. Can they pause, or do I have to have two separate? Oh, that's a good question. Let's just, we'll have two separate if we have to. So, let's um, finish this out uh, by uh, reflecting on um, certain characteristics or properties or notes of an ecumenical council. We'll just look at an ecumenical council as, you know, as a concept. First, let's talk about the authoritative character of the ecumenical council. Um, we, might, um, we might augment this uh, by uh, saying that uh, the authoritative character of an ecumenical council is uh, finally charismatic. In other words, it's of the Holy Spirit. And this, uh, this comes into view when you consider that uh, so many of the fathers of the ecumenical councils are honored in the church as saints. Saint Nicholas of Myra and Lycia. You know Saint Nicholas? He's Santa Claus. The bastardization of, of Saint Nicholas, but still, even a Santa Claus, he gives joy to the world. Um, he was there. Uh, Saint Athanasius of Alexandria, the great champion of Nicaea. I seen. I think Saint Gregory Thaumaturgus was there, the wonder worker. Um, 
At the council, there would have been not just the bishop, but there were also presbyters or priests and deacons, as there are in any, at, at any council even today. Uh, there would have been monastics. Um, and no doubt there would be, have been you know, uh, imperial um, representatives. Somebody had to take minutes. Somebody had to uh, you know, be the tellers. Somebody had to be the gophers. You know, the, what do you call those things today in a council? The, um, the pages or whatever they are. So this was a grand affair, uh, but we call it, but we, we, when we speak of the Council of Nicaea, we talk about the 318 fathers, because that's how many bishops were present, 318 bishops. The um, Ecumenical Council is authoritative, so on your lecture guide that we're on the second page now, we're going, and I had no clue as to how much space to give you, so that's why, you know, and making your notes, that's why you have this blank page. In case the space that I give you isn't enough, you can spill all over into this blank page. Um, the authoritative character of an ecumenical council draws from the fact that it, that it's, it defines and makes clear the things of God. It defines and makes the clear the things of God. So that when we, when, when, if, when one who receives the different canons or the rules or the standards uh, of, of, the, of, the, of the ecumenical council, uh, one is receiving the faith of the apostles, uh, both in theory and in praxis, in practice, because these canons that come out of the ecumenical councils not only deal with matters of faith, but they also deal with matters of administration, uh, matters of, uh, of, of worship, um, matters of protocol, ecclesial protocol, relationships between different uh, jurisdictions, uh, diff different how you know the, the the roles that each bishop and, his, that the, and, and the local bishop has in his particular diocese uh, to help govern and keep things in order of the church, keep things in good order. Um, the ecumenical council actually embodies the Lord's promise to His disciples. So the ecumenical council, or the council, let's just say a council of the church, is not an invention of later decades or centuries. The very concept of a council, the very practice of a council is rooted in the New Testament. You remember what the Lord says to his disciples in John chapter 16, verse 13. This is at his, uh, when he's talking to them just before his passion. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And then there is the model of the, ecumen of the council, not of an ecumenical council and any council of the church uh, from the Apostles' Council in Jerusalem. In Acts 15, 28, it records the, the, uh, the decision that the, the, that that council of the Holy Apostles made with regard to the question of circumcision and bringing Gentiles into the church. What it says is, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And this is what they disseminated to all the churches that, were, um, that had been founded by the apostles and were overseen by the apostles and their successors, the bishops. So you notice there, it seemed good to us, to the Holy Spirit and to us, that there's a cooperation um, there's a cooperation of the apostles and their, bish their successors, the bishops, with the Holy Spirit. There's a cooperation which presupposes that such is possible, and not only is it possible, but in fact it happens. This is the model for every official gathering of the church in the deliberative process, session. For example, at the, uh, in the OCA, uh, the diocesan assembly that's coming up next week, or at the national council uh, that we hold every three years. The council begins by singing, um, the grace of the Holy Spirit has assembled us here today. Because the council is a gathering or a synod, the technical word would be synod, that's another word for it, synod, which means a coming together, a meeting together, a meeting of the bishops. It's a, a synod of the whole church. 
An ecumenical council is a synod of the whole church. There are local synods, which are the gathering of local bishops. The diocesan assembly, the diocese of the Midwest that we'll be doing next, Sunday, next uh, week, that's a synod. It's a local synod of the, of the priests and their deacons and the, and the faithful, the delegates, gathered around the bishop. Um, because it is a gathering of the whole church, we receive the ecumenical council as an authoritative witness of the faith that is delivered once for all to the saints, drawing from Jude, chapter 1, verse 3. You could say that the deliberations of the, of the ecumenical council um, are, the, are a kind of incarnation, a kind of an embodiment of the Holy Spirit. Uh, guiding the faithful into an orthodox understanding of Holy Scripture's witness to the mystery of God, hidden from the ages and generations and revealed to his saints. This too might catch you. How do you, you know, given how many of us were shaped in kind of a biblical fundamentalism, no one is more dedicated to the Bible than the Orthodox Church. We don't thump it, we kiss it. <laughs> Um, it sits on the altar. Um, but how are you going to read it? It's a book of the Spirit. It's a witness to the Spirit. So how can you just come to it, you know, with any old mindset and think you're going to understand it? You have to know, you have to, you have to know, you have to be listening to the Spirit that inspired the Scriptures. So how are you going to know? Who are you to say what the Bible says? Honestly, you know, so the, the council of, of the bishops, the priests, the deacons, the faithful, in other words, the gathering of the whole church, the council is really just a, a microcosm of the whole church because the whole church is there. Bishops, priests, deacons, faithful, they're all there. Um, it's the church gathered in council under the grace of the Holy Spirit that um, determines, you know, that, that guides us in, in understanding how we read and understand the biblical witness to the mystery of the Incarnation. So that's the authoritative character. Those are the notes that I have for the Council as authoritative. The uh, next note is the Council as what is it, conciliar? Yes. So notice in, in how we have just described uh, the council, the ecumenical council, or any, any synod of the church. Notice how it presents, um, uh, um, let us note that as the apostolic council in Jerusalem shows, the church in its apostolic foundational character, in its apostolic foundational character, is conciliar. Even at the, okay, who was, who was presiding at the Council of Jerusalem, by the way? Exactly, it was St. James. It was not St. Peter. St. James. Uh, but did St. Ja James make the decision? And the others just follow, uh, fall in, fell in line? No. The decision was made after much deliberation, much discussion, even argument. And it was, a, it was a consensus of all the apostles. And as they said, it was a consensus that they came to in the grace of the Holy Spirit. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us that this is what we are going to do in this particular situation. The, the, the discernment of what is good to the Holy Spirit, I mean, that's the goal of the council, to discern what is good to the Holy Spirit. It's to the Holy Spirit and to us. Notice that it's the Holy Spirit first. What well, seemed good to the Holy Spirit, and so since it's good to the Holy Spirit, it's good to us, is how you could interpret that. What well, seemed good, what it seemed to us good to the Holy Spirit and to us, this is what we declare to you. So this, this, this process of discerning what is good to the Holy Spirit which the Lord himself promised he would send to us and, 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 that the, and, and who would guide us after his resurrection and his, day, his ascension into heaven, who would guide us into all truth. 
This is the, this is the objective of the council, so that the discernment process is collegial. It's the bishops discerning together. Get, and, and, and here, too, is important. So if you look at your lecture guide, I have a, a picture of an icon there. This is the, an icon of the First Ecumenical Council. You see the, the Holy Fathers gathered. And where are they gathered? And this, is, this icon is, is very instructive. What's at the center? Can you, can you make it out? The Bible. The Bible. And what's it in front of? Where are they? Yes, and what are they sitting in front of? The Iconostas, the royal gates. Do you know what they have just done? I'm, I'm pretty sure what they have just done. They have celebrated the divine liturgy. It's the first thing you do when you come together in, in, a, in a gathering of the church. We celebrate the divine liturgy so that um, the, the having, having received the Holy Spirit in the consecrated bread and wine of the church, now we proceed to gather in council and to discern what's good to the Holy Spirit, which is to say that this, this, this uh, conciliar uh, process of discernment of what is good to the Holy Spirit proceeds from the altar of the church. That's what I want you to understand. It proceeds. The altar of the church is the, if you will, the criterion of truth. So that the the, the council itself and all of its proceedings, they are rooted in the body and blood of the Savior. They are responsible to the body and blood of the Savior that we have just eaten and drunk. They are not rooted in a theoretical, abstract way, but in a spiritual or mystical way, a real way that is very concrete and physical. We don't just... You know, for us, the body, the, the bread and the wine that are consecrated, they're not memorials. They are the body and blood of Christ himself. So when we say that, that our deliberations are rooted in the body and blood of Christ, we're not talking um, in the remembrance of the body and blood of Christ. We're, talk, we're saying that they are rooted in a very physical, concrete way in the actual mystery of Christ himself. So again, you can see how, if this is the case, how are you going to prove that? <laughs> you can't. Um, so from the Council of Jerusalem to today, the church comes together regularly in synodal gatherings to discern together the will of the Holy Spirit. The ecumenical council is distinguished from a local council simply in that it is a gathering of all the bishops of the whole church scattered throughout the inhabited earth or the ecumene. Now having said this, we must immediately qualify it, nuance it. It is not simply, and this is where, this is where it gets messy, real messy. It is not simply that a council is a gathering of all the bishops that makes it authoritative. It must also be a true expression of, in, Saint, in the words of St. Irenaeus at the end of the second century, it must be a true expression of what is, as it is. In other words, it must be a true expression of the truth. Not just what seems good to us, but what seems good also to the Holy Spirit. This is what makes a council ecumenical or authoritative. Moreover, what the council expresses must be faithful to the rule of faith. In other words, the faith of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church scattered throughout the, the, scattered throughout the inhabited earth. It must be faithful to that before that council will be considered by the church as, before it will be given the term ecumenical. Can you see how messy that is? <laughs> because it doesn't prove anything. You know, from terms of logic, it doesn't prove anything. It's almost a circular argument. And, and, the, and it's wide open for you to come forward and to say, yeah, we just had an ecumenical council. This is the rule of faith. This is what the church says. And there have been councils like that. In the fifth century, for example, well, there are several councils. In the fourth, in the fifth century, is that when it was? Fourth, fifth century, there was a council that was in fact a local synod, just local bishops, just, just the bishops in that immediate area gathered around St. Cyril of Alexandria. Uh, they, they made a decision against Nestorius, 
who was denying that the Virgin Mary was mother of God. You would say she was mother of Christ or mother of Jesus, but he would not say she was mother of God. So they, they, um, they repudiated him. But it was a local synod. But it was because what it, the faith that it expressed was considered by the church to be true and to be faithful to the church's rule of faith, it, had, it was considered ecumenical. It's called the Third Ecumenical Council of the Church. In 449, there was a council that was convened, and it called itself ecumenical. We are convening an ecumenical council. Um, but that council um, made a decision, made decisions that were not faithful to the rule of faith by the bishops who were there, and it came to be called the Robber Synod, or the Synod of Thieves. It was not regarded as an ecumenical council. So you see, it's not just that we say it's an ecumenical council that makes it an ecumenical council. This is what makes it messy. It must be faithful to the truth. So how are you going to determine the truth? Again, it's an ascetic. It's an ascetic way. It's a spiritual. It's a way of prayer. Um, this is how you determine what's, what's the truth. Um, so from the viewpoint of the world, an ecumenical council is not proof of anything. So the creed of the ecumenical councils, their decisions and definitions of faith are authoritative only to those who receive them as authoritative. How circular can you get? But if one does not accept them as authoritative, one is saying that one does not believe that the faith that they give is a true expression of what really is as it is. Did you catch that? Um, I don't know, I, I, it seems to me that in, in, in so many circles, especially here in the West, everything has to be cut and dried. And it has to be a very objective, you know, you have something you can bump against. But this is not like that at all, so it may be hard for us to grasp. Uh, and it, it accounts perhaps for why the church, the, the Orthodox Church today is in such a political mess, you know. And yet beneath that mess is the Holy Eucharist going on in every pocket of the Orthodox Church. The Russians and the Greeks are still protect, uh, receiving the body and blood of Christ, and they're still you know, teaching the same faith, uh, um, the same sacraments, they're, they're doing the same ascetic disciplines, the same spirituality. But on the surface, in the world of geopol geopolitics, it is an absolute mess. It looks like a hopeless mess. Carson, you had a question? Yes, and, and if it is a true expression of the rule of faith. I mean, you can receive it as ecumenical, but if it's not an expression of the rule of faith, what good does that do you? So yes, if this is hard for you to grasp, it's because it's so messy and so circular. It's not cut and dried. There's nothing compelling about it. Nothing compels you to believe it. You can reject it if you want to. And there's no bolt of lightning that's going to come down and hit you. So let's say a word on ecumenical, and then I think with this we'll be able to be done. We've already pointed out that ecumenical, from the Greek word ekumene, for universal, means the whole civilized world. An ecumenical council, as we also pointed out, is the one faith, or expresses the one faith of the whole church scattered throughout the world. That is, not just any group that asserts itself to be the church, but note well that, the, that, that um, it, 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 expresses that not the it, it expresses the faith of the church, not just any church, it expresses the faith of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Um, so it's interesting. You go to these churches, claiming, some of them claiming to be apostolic, but look at the creed that they're saying. And if it is the creed, they're saying it, are they in communion with the church that confesses that creed? And if they're not, why not? What's, why not? Um, something is, something's not a right. Um, but if we, if you do accept that creed and you are in communion with those who recite that creed, then you are in communion with 
this, let's call it a body, that claims that she is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. She here is the body of Christ. Here is the faith delivered once for all to the saints. You're, you're, you're aligning yourself with that group. But how are you going to prove it? <laughs> well, okay. Finally, there you can say there are two proofs. There are two proofs. The one proof, you could say, is dogmatic. Drawing from St. John. Oh, I can never remember what the passage is. Chapter 4, verse 2, I don't remember. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit which denies that Jesus is the Christ come in the flesh is not of God. Now many churches will confess the incarnation. You have all grown up, I expect, in churches that confess the incarnation. That's one reason that you're receptive to the Orthodox Church. But then, if you confess that Jesus is God, the Word incarnate, that's going to have certain consequences. And if you confess it, then I want to know, okay? Where are your icons? Where are your sacraments? And what do you say Holy Eucharist to be? Is it just a memorial? Or do you believe it and experience it to be the real body and blood of Christ? Where's your priesthood? Well, what's, what's the character of your, of your worship? Which is a way of saying that the Orthodox Church, we believe and we confess. This is the central tenet, if you will, that Jesus is God, the Word incarnate. In fact, it's from that confession that we see that God is Trinity. Outside of that incarnation, you're not of the incarnation of that confession. You're not going to see that God is Trinity, or you're going to see God as Trinity in maybe the way that the Hindus see God as Trinity, or in the way that maybe Plotinus saw God as Trinity. But you're not going to see God as Trinity in the biblical way. Um, and out of that confession, everything that we do, everything that we say and do follows from that confession. Why do we have icons? Because it expresses the incarnation. Why do we venerate Mary as Theotokos, Mother of God? It's because it is an expression, it's an affirmation of the incarnation. If, God, if the one that she bore is not God, the Word, then you can't call her Theotokos. So to call her Theotokos is actually a confession of the one that she bore as God the Word incarnate. These are simply illustrations to show that everything that we say and do, everything is an affirmation, an expression of our central conviction that God the Word incarnate is Jesus Christ. The second criterion of proof is uh, more, however you want to say it, spiritual. And that is um, the, that is love for one's enemy. That is the mark of the Holy Spirit. Love for one's enemy. The ability to forgive as you have been forgiven. To bless those who revile you and persecute you. To be good to those who hate you. All of these are proofs that the spirit that is working in you from, and that you confess with your word, with your mouth, and in your deeds is of God. So, it's, so when I say it's messy, yes, it's messy, but there are, there are those two proofs, if you will, to clean it up <laughs> and uh, make it less messy. Um, I just want to close out here. Uh, the purpose of an ecumenical council is not, as the term ecumenical is used today, to find consensus at the level of the least common denominator among different bodies teaching different doctrines. Rather, the ecumenical council, in an orthodox way, is to define and articulate the true faith, the true mystery of Christ delivered once for all to the saints against false or heretical teaching. So ecumenical in the ancient Christian world, starting from the fourth century on, when ecumenical councils began to be called, because they could be called, before then they really couldn't be called because the church was illegal, 
it would have been logistically impossible probably to have a worldwide ecumenical council. But the way the ecumenical, the word ecumenical you know, was understood in the ancient world, um, the way it was used is the way that we would use the word orthodox today. So ecumenical, you know, from the orthodox perspective is a synonym to orthodox. Um, and in the way the term is used today, from the mind of the ancient church, it has changed. So that now the term ecumenical, from our perspective, is synonymous with heresy. <laughs> and actually the ecumenical movement, as it is so-called, was started, was, was started by Protestants. It's like they could sense within themselves that there was something missing, so they're, they're reaching out, trying to trying to become, become one with the others because they can feel that there's not a unity there. They're, they're just kind of, you know, they're, they're separated amongst themselves. They can feel that it's not right. So out of that unease, they, they start this ecumenical movement, hoping that maybe the, all of them come together, they can heal the, the unease that's underneath. But the Orthodox have no sense of that. We have no sense of anything missing or lacking. Nothing, no sense at all. Um, so as a result, our involvement in the ecumenical movement is controversial amongst us. There are those of us who um, are against our involvement in the ecumenical movement because we feel that it dilutes our witness. Uh, it makes us appear to accept the ecumenical assumption that there are many denominations, many churches. We don't believe that. There's only one church. But then there are those who uh, uh, endorse our involvement in the ecumenical movement simply because we, they, they feel, we feel that uh, we need to be giving witness. We need to make ourselves accessible so that those who are seeking will find us. And we need to make ourselves accessible in every possible way that we can. Um, I myself used to be involved in the ecumenical dialogue. I was involved with the Lutheran Orthodox National Dialogue for two, three years. And I don't say that I'm militantly against it, but I just got tired of it. And so I'm not involved anymore. I chose to step down. Okay, so maybe I'll close with just a little story to illustrate. Um, so I was involved in the uh, Lutheran Orthodox National Dialogue. And I remember sitting around the table, the Lutherans on this side, the Orthodox on this side. I don't remember what the issue was that we were discussing. It was, it's immaterial. But I remember that whatever it was, um, the, the, the issue was put on the table so that we could start uh, discussing it to find points of agreement or disagreement between us. And as soon as it was put on the table, the Lutherans began arguing amongst themselves as to what the Lutherans really believe on that. Um, and <laughs> it got to the point where we Orthodox, we just kind of sat back and, and watched. They were going at each other. No, we don't. No, this, this is not what Luther meant. Oh, he meant this. Oh, what about, what about Chemnitz? This is what he said. da 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 um, that happened more than once. Whereas on the Orthodox side, we never caucused, you know, never got together to strategize, okay, what are we going to say on this? What are we going to say on that? We never did that. But on every issue, there was unanimity. We knew what we believe. Um, there was never any argument. To me, that was the visible, you know, uh, visible evidence of what I'm trying to, what I'm, what I'm describing here with regards to the, um, the rule of faith of the church, this, this spiritual, immaterial, mysterious um, um, presence of the Holy Spirit um, that guides the church and gives, gives to the church her character, um, her, her flavor, her experience, her, 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 her fragrance. So, so my experience has been that as I've, you know, become more and more immersed in, in the life of the church, uh, you get to where you can just kind of, you, you know, you can sense it. You can, certain expressions of the faith have a, they have an odor about them. That is not what I recognize. They have a flavor. They have a, there's something about them that just isn't right. And you can't put your finger on it. It just doesn't feel right. You go to some, we go to some uh, well, I know, um, people that we know, grew up with. You know, we might be um, uh, lassoed into participating against our will. 
to one of their services. And I just had the experience, you know, they're saying the name Christ, they're saying the name Jesus, they're saying certain phrases they're saying are okay, but there's just something about it I have to say, you know, I don't know who this Christ is that you're praying to. I don't recognize him. He's not the Christ that I pray to. I don't know him. And I don't particularly like being here. It's just not comfortable. All right. <laughs> so, questions, comments, observations. Yes, Liz. Um, just a question about the words of the, the use of the word ecumenical, because I think um, the Bishop of Constantinople is called the ecumenical. Correct. Patriarch. Correct. And I was wondering why, what is that term? The patriarch, the Constantinopolitan, the, the patriarch of Constantinople is called the ecumenical patriarch, but so also is the Pope of Rome. He was first called the Ecumenical Patriarch, which means, you know, like uh, the main bishop of the whole world, of the whole Christian world. The Roman bishop, the Pope, was the Ecumenical Bishop, because as the Bishop of Rome, which was the capital of the empire, he was by he was the the lead bishop uh, as, as as by in, in honor. Not um, not so, so much historically, because the first church was Jerusalem. So if you're going to um, assign, um, you know, the, the, the highest rank in terms of history, well, that would be the Jerusalem patriarch. And he'd be the one that's kind of the, 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 the whole, who's the president of all the, of all the churches. And then that would be James, that would not be Peter. Uh, but because Peter and Paul both died in Rome, and because Rome was the capital of the empire, the Roman bishop acquired a prestige of honor. And then when uh, the patriarch of, uh, I don't remember now which patriarch it was in Constantinople, who, who first styled himself as the ecumenical patriarch, I think it was in the, maybe in the 4th, 5th, 6th century, sometime in there, uh, he, the, the Roman pope was not happy at all with, with that, because what he was claiming is that He's the Pope, he's the, the bishop that enjoys the prestige of the of highest honor. So that when the bishops gather together, there's the question, okay, who's going to preside over this council of bishops? You've got to have a presider, otherwise you're going to have chaos. So it's, it's the, uh, it's the uh, bishop that has the highest rank. And for us, that would be the, the patriarch of Constantinople. So now, you know, when Constantinople fell, to the Turks, uh, Moscow, the Moscow Patriarch assumed uh, kind of the role of the, the last remaining. So the Mo Moscow was called the Third Rome, Constantinople was called the Second Rome, Moscow was called the Third Rome. Um, but that of course is a set up uh, friction between Moscow and Constantinople, because Constantinople, the Patriarch there is not yet ready to concede his, his prestige. You know, just because the city of Constantinople now has fallen to the Turks, he's not ready to do that. So, you know, I, I don't follow all of the geopolitics between Moscow and Constantinople, and there's a long history to that, to that conflict, that, that uh, disagreement. Um, but I, I think at the bottom of it is, uh, really, you know, who is the, uh, who is, uh, who's the one that would preside? So it'd be interesting if, if, if the Pet Moscow Patriarch and the, uh, Greek patriarch, were to, the constant old patriarch were to come together. I don't, here I'm, here I'm starting to get into waters that are way above my head, so I should probably stop talking, because if anybody's listening who knows all this, they're going to say, Father Paul, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, so that's what it means, basically. When they get together, he's the one who would preside. Practically, that's what it means. All right, any other questions? Yes, Hans? Uh, in making the sign of the cross, I mean, how often are you supposed to do it? Okay. How are you supposed to do it? Because I mean, I, you know, it's a job question. I don't know, and so I don't That's fine. participate. So I don't know. So if I if I don't know why or what or how or sure. how often, I, I, don't, I don't see a reason to do it. Sure. Yet. So I just want to know sure. when you're supposed and to. And we do need to go into those very practical, down to earth issues. We can't be dwelling all the time in the in the clouds of this this history. Um, and actually, my intention was maybe the second part of this of this class. We can go into those kinds of things. So the first part can be kind of the uh, intellectual, whatever. The second part can be the really down to earth. But I you know I got kind of caught up in this. It was very interesting, and I didn't want to stop. So oh, yeah, I get. I just, <laughs> just asking. Um, 
you'll notice that we make the sign of the cross every time we say the name of the Holy Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you'll see us all making the sign of the cross. Um, did you know that the, that the name for God in Hebrew, um, is, what is it? There's a, 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 a Hebrew letter, the Tau. Don't ask me how this works out because I don't know if I can show it, but this is, there's the Tau. Um, somehow it's abbreviation, maybe this, I don't know. But anyway, this is the sign of God's name. I'd have to go back and review the, the details of this so that I could show you coherently how we get to this. So even in the Old Testament, uh, the cross, or the Tau, this is certainly the Greek letter, um, is the sign of God's name. It's the shorthand form of God's name. Um, when the angel of the Lord passed over the homes of Israel, remember that was at every home that had uh, taking the blood of the Passover of the lamb and, and put a, a drop of blood on the door like this, whatever this is called, whatever that is called, the lintels, the threshold, you'll see that it was in the form, in the sign of God's name. The angel of the Lord passed over that house. Uh, when Israel um, marched through the, river, the Red Sea, I believe it was, maybe even through the desert, they marched in the ranks or in the form of God's name. So, the so when it says in the New Testament, when 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 uh, when the, uh, the the New Testament church draws from the Psalm, I believe it's Psalm one seventeen in the Septuagint. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You can see what they're saying. Here's Jesus. Well, so here's the sign of God's name. This is the sign of God's name. And you can see that Jesus, this is beautiful, you know. Jesus, as a man, is outstretched on the cross in the sign of God's name. So here this is here it is, the uh, the proclamation, even in his death. This is this is this is, this is mind-boggling, that, that even in his death, God, Jesus is showing himself to be the name of God. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is revealed in Christ's death to be a prophecy of the death of God, the Sabbath rest, the Sabbath rest that Moses was talking about in Genesis. This is the Sabbath rest. So you can see that for us to make the sign of the cross is uh, um, it's so commonplace to us that we probably don't think of it, anything of it. We've, but when you see people coming into the church who are not shaped in this environment and how uncomfortable some of them are in making the sign of the cross, you realize um, how powerful that, 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 that gesture is to make the sign of the cross over yourself. You're, you're making this, you're, you're signing yourself with the whole mystery of God. His, his, you know, his name, who is Jesus Christ, and with the mystery of God that was revealed, that was hidden from the ages, revealed to his saints, which is the death of God. I mean, how can God die? This too was a controversy, by the way, in the fifth century. How can God die? And yet it is said, and you know, it is as much as says that he dies in the Old Testament, the prophets. That's what the Sabbath rest is all about. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. So whenever you hear the name of God, that's why I, that, that, you, know, you see the connection between the name of God and the sign of the cross. And maybe when we say the, when we, when we commemorate the Theotokos, we'll make the sign of the cross. Why? because she's the temple in whom God dwells. And so it's an expression of our, you know, of our belief, of our conviction, our experience of the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, as the mystery of the Old Testament temple in whom God dwells, as well as an expression of how much we love her, you know, and, and venerate her. Um, you see us making the sign of the cross as just as a prayer. 
um, you hear some bad news or you hear um, somebody dies, you see the Orthodox making the sign of the cross. Um, it's a form of a prayer, an intercession for the person who just died or for the person who's suffering. So, not to make the sign of the cross and to claim yourself to be a Christian. <laughs> How sad. <laughs> you don't know what you're depriving yourself of. You're confessing it with your mouth and then you're taking it away by your actions. Any other questions? Okay, now we're really getting basic, aren't we? Take the three. Do you know that? You know the answer to that question? Uh, I see it. It's done. Okay, you take these three fingers as a, this, this, these three fingers, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, so it represents the Trinity. Okay. Take these two fingers, represents the human and divine natures of Christ. You put them down. Okay. And then you put your thumbs together. So you have three fingers, two fingers. This is the whole mystery of, of God. God, the Holy Trinity, the mystery of the Incarnation. Think of forehead to the heart, right shoulder, left shoulder. Damn. And then what is, like, in connection with that, what does it mean sometimes when, like, people touch Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just uh, that that is, th th there, it's, a, it's an expression of, of contrition. Um, Honestly, I don't know the, the details behind that. I just know that you do it at certain times. And this what are those times? Yeah. Well, you know, I couldn't tell you. So I just look around. When everybody else is doing it, I do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a priest. But yeah, at the, it, it's just, it's, it's like, uh, so I go like this, or like this, and you go like this. Is that how you do it? I don't do it so much anymore because I can't. My hips won't bend. Um, that's just, I think we call that a matanya, matanya, which is Greek for repentance. So it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's an expression of contrition. You know, you're signing yourself with the cross, and it's just all the way, all the way down here. And you're bending, you know, and bowing, you know, the word for worship means to bow. So it's a, it's, it's a physical way of worshiping God. And when you come to God, you don't just bow. I mean, you're coming before God, you know, who died in the in whose very name has been revealed to mean uh, his death for us. And you know, so you don't just come and, and bow to him, that's what others would do. But we who confess that Jesus is the Christ, the name of God who has come in the name of the Lord, you know, we when when we make that that pros that bowing, that we we make the sign of the cross. We turn the whole bowing into the sign of the cross. And then finally, there's the prostration, where you fall down on the uh, ground. And that too is a, that too is worship. That's what it is to worship, proskuneo, to worship, to 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 bend the knee, to fall down to the ground. That is worship. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Very good. And then we'll see you. So we'll come back next Saturday. And uh, continue this and maybe get into more of these practical issues. <laughs> All right.